Kerbals have explored many domains. We've seen space, the skies, the sea, the land. But there's another domain Kerbals haven't explored. A forbidden domain. It lies beneath the surface of every KSP planet, and bars entry to any daring Kerbal. While it may seem impossible to visit, it turns out there is a way. Today, we're going to develop a technology to explore the underworld of KSP. Our story begins during the Drace Canyon Bridge Project. In that project, I used a technique called Bendy Tech to create a set of ramps that clip through the terrain. Here's a quick overview on how that works. You first create a flexible joint out of bendy parts, such as a stack of ant engines. Then, in flight, you can bend the joint however you want. When you time warp or exit the physics range of the craft, the game will return the parts back to their original position. In the case of the Drace Bridge, the original position has the parts clipping through the ground. Since we never enter the physics range of the bridge again, the ground collider doesn't act on these parts, and they stay in this precarious state. Of course, if we either get too close to the root part, or switch to the craft, physics will be applied again and the craft will be destroyed. So this got me thinking. Those ramp sections did get below the ground. And looking at it with a free camera, it looks like the ground collider is a paper-thin boundary. If we built this differently, would it be possible to get past this collider somehow? Could we actually get a craft below the surface and explore the underworld of KSP planets? My first thought was to build a craft that had a portion of it beneath the surface. So I created this rover here. It's made of two sections, an upper segment that can drive around the surface, and a lower section that is intended to glitch below the surface. Surprisingly, this thing works exactly as expected. Once we roll it off the runway, comically dragging the lower section along, we can just hit time warp and, just like that, the lower section is underground. What a truly bizarre sight. Above us, we have the Space Center, and below us, we have more ocean. Yeah, apparently Kerbin is full of water inside. Okay, so this is shown we can get partially below the ground. Let's see if we can go further. Let's drop a probe. And... oh... no. Yeah, it seems KSP is wising up to our tricks here. If we simply detach a craft below the surface, the game seems to recognize that it shouldn't be there, and destroys it. This seems like a showstopper, but actually there is a way around it, and it has to do with how the game treats craft states. Crafts in KSP can exist in a variety of states depending on where they are. Using Kerbal Engineer, we can see what state a craft is in. For example, this craft here is in a landed state, this one is in an orbiting state, and this one is in a flight state. One state we can take advantage of is the splashed down state. When you are in a splashed down state, you can go below the surface of the water as you please. We can use this in our glitch case. Let's build a bendy tech arm that is long enough to touch that subsurface ocean. We'll just bend this into position and time warp. And there we are, below the surface, touching the ocean now. We can now dump our probe directly off. And once safely in the water, the probe is given the splashdown state, and the game is fooled. It no longer destroys our probe. So yeah, 
It appears the destruction logic only destroys the craft if you are in a flight state and below the ground. If we're in a different state, we will be fine. So, now that we're in the water, can we jump out and fly around? Sadly, the answer is no. As soon as we leave the water, our state changes to a flight state and we are destroyed. So another roadblock, huh? Well, not quite. We have some more shenanigans we can perform. Specifically, physics range exploits. The Drace Canyon Bridge video has some more specifics on this, but the important thing to know is that there are two loading ranges for a craft. The 2.5 kilometer loading range for the craft itself, and a smaller 350 meter loading range for the physics. That means if we make a craft over 350 meters long, we can collide with the craft without loading physics for it. Which lets us do some weird stuff. Let me show you. What I have here is a 350 meter long craft, with a bendy tech hinge at the end of it. At the end of the hinge, I've attached a probe. What happens if we actuate the hinge and deploy the probe? Doesn't look special so far. The probe is just sitting on top of the platform. Or is it? The probe is more than 350 meters away which means its physics are disabled. We have given this probe a landed state. But that's not all. If we then switch to the probe, something incredible happens. Since we left the physics range of the main craft by switching crafts, the bendy tech joint returns back to normal, which drops our probe off. However, since we gave the craft a landed state earlier, we get to keep that state, even while flying around. I'm not 100% sure why this happens, but I suspect since the craft is landed in midair, the game is missing some sort of check to transition it from a landed state to a flight state. Whatever the underlying logic is, we now have a trick to fly underground. We can glitch the same hinge assembly underground, using the same technique as before, Actuate the hinge, release the aircraft, and then switch to it. And there we are. We have a landed state now, and can explore underground as we please. We now have the tools to explore underground. We just need a base of operations. I designed this base here to perform that duty. It's got power, habitation, mining, all the infrastructure we need for a scientific endeavor. And of course, below, we have a 350 meter long arm for deployments of probes and aircraft into the abyss. Okay, so let's launch it. For the launch vehicle, I'm using my super heavy scalable launch system that I designed in a previous video. As this is a draggy payload with lots of perpendicular wing segments, we will be taking a steep ascent profile to get out of the atmosphere quickly. This ended up being a pretty bad launch profile, but I over-engineered the launch vehicle so we do have enough delta-v to get to orbit, even if the launch profile is more like a 90 degree angle than a curve. Once in orbit, we can begin our burn to Duna. I chose Duna for this base because it's the only body with a surface, no ocean, and an atmosphere. Perfect for flying around. The transfer is pretty standard, so let's quickly skip through this. All that's left is a sketchy Duna aero break and some insertion burns. And we are in Duna orbit. Landing this thing is gonna be tricky. The base isn't aerodynamically stable, so we need to take our descent slowly. So yeah, we're spending a lot of fuel above the atmosphere to first slow down. I packed over 2 kilometers per second of delta V for this reason. The base itself needs a flat area to land on, which turns out is pretty rare on Duna. 
As a result, I picked out a landing site beforehand, which we are targeting now. As a bonus, this landing site will also have a great view of Ike. The whole landing procedure is going to be complicated because of the subsurface arm. We obviously can't just land on top of it. We need to engage the Bendy Tech first. Currently, the arm is held in place by some heaviest auto struts, which can be disabled to fully release the mechanism. The arm is fairly heavy though, so we need to wait until we are just above the ground to release it. So, the first step in our landing procedure is to get into a hover right above the ground, and then release the arm. Next, we need to worry about how to get the base onto the ground safely. Which is a problem because there is now an arm in our way. We can't really go straight down, otherwise we would basically squish it. Instead, we need to take an arc of a descent, with the ground anchor point as our focus. If we go too far away from this point, we'll pull the arm back up and overstretch the bendy tech joint. Likewise, if we get too close, we'll overstretch the joint in the other direction. This was definitely one of the more challenging landings I've taken on. But after some care, and failed attempts, we managed to get the base to its final location. Now comes for the fun part. We now get to re-engage some of those auto struts we disabled, and then hit time warp. And just like that, we are now under the surface of Duna. We just need to do a couple more things now. First up, as with any KSP base, we need to ditch the landing system, unfurl the solar panels, and extend any communication equipment. Then, we need to ditch the anchor at the end of the arm. Fortunately, KSP makes cleanup of the debris easy. The detached sections of course have in-flight states and are promptly devoured by the void. Our base of operations is now established. Let's go have some fun. First off, we have two Nerva-powered aircraft here we can use to fly around under the surface. To deploy them, we just pivot the hinge down to get them out of the 350 meter physics range, raise these set of air brakes to barely touch the aircraft, and then undock it to gift it a landed state. We can then switch to the aircraft and go flying. Flying underground is quite a surreal sight. The terrain looms above us with a seemingly infinite void below. Instead of worrying about losing altitude, we need to worry about going too high and crashing into the ground. From this vantage point, we can see some things we normally cannot. For example, the underside of easter eggs like the Duna face. Sadly, there isn't a buff Jeb model underneath the terrain, it's just a face. So, for the most part, flying underground is similar to flying above ground, with the exception of landing. Because of our landed state shenanigans, we can't touch anything or else our state will change and we will be destroyed. This means we can't land on a runway or landing pad. The only way to get around this is to dock with the base instead. Fortunately this is possible, but requires some setup. We first need to approach the base from underneath, get within the physics loading range so that our claw will work, and then grab a part with that. To help with this procedure, I've stowed some RCS thrusters in this cargo bay to provide translation control. And after some careful maneuvering, we managed to land back home at our docking port. I'm sure we've got some fantastic data for the crew back at the lab. So we've seen the true nature of Duna's surface. But what's down there? It looks like the planet is completely hollow all the way down. But is it really? To answer that question, we've included some probes we can drop directly off into the void. 
Same deployment procedure as the aircraft. Only difference is this one isn't coming back. I've opened up some sensor data to monitor the descent, and right away you can see some interesting things happening. For one, even though we're descending deeper into some sort of atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure is staying the same. It seems the void remains at sea level pressure. Another interesting thing to note is that our gravitational acceleration is increasing as we get lower. This is opposite of what you'd expect with a real planet because as you get lower you have more mass above you, which in turn reduces the gravitational acceleration. But in our case the gravity is increasing, which suggests that the planet's mass is all below us. This could get very interesting. At around 140 kilometers below the surface, our gravity has increased to 1g. Same as Kerbin surface gravity. At 230 kilometers, we need to deploy our drogue chute to slow down. We're now at almost 4 g's of acceleration. It doesn't take long for things to get even further out of hand. At 270 kilometers, we need to deploy our main chute. We are well over 10 g's of acceleration. Our acceleration only continues to skyrocket. At 300 kilometers, we are at 80 g's. At 310 kilometers, we surpass 300. Unsurprisingly, we can't take much more of this. At 315 kilometers below the surface, we hit over 1,000 g's and the probe is destroyed. It seems that there is a singularity at the center of Duna. And indeed, if we plot the gravitational acceleration versus distance, we get a perfect inverse square relationship, with a singularity at a depth of 320 kilometers, which uncoincidentally is also the radius of Duna. So yeah, Duna is a hollow shell of a planet with a black hole at its center. I've got one last trick up my sleeve to explore this anomaly. Here we have a probe that heavily exploits the game's aerodynamics and heating model. Let's get it deployed, and I'll show you what it can do. The goal of this probe is to enter an orbit around the core of Duna, and then gradually descend. So the first step is to burn horizontally to raise our periapsis. Once that's done, we can descend further into Duna and use aerodynamic lift to circularize our orbit. I know, this thing doesn't look aerodynamic. But as I said, this craft exploits the game heavily. I'm not going to go into full detail on how these bugs work, but the general idea is that we're using fairing occlusion to create a craft with almost no drag, and that is fully protected from aerodynamic heating by this front plate. If you're interested how this works, Lieutenant Duckweed has an excellent video on the topic. For our case, the glitch craft allows us to orbit around the core of Duna without overheating. Our orbital period starts out at about 3 minutes for a full orbit, which is already pretty fast for a KSP body. However, as the orbit decays, the period gets shorter and shorter. I just want to emphasize how silly this looks in the map view. Not only can you see the craft whirling around the center, you can also see the latitude and longitude coordinates changing rapidly as well. If you just looked at the latitude-longitude numbers here, and assumed this craft was traveling over the surface, you would calculate that it was going over 130 kilometers per second. Land speed record, I guess? As the probe continues to descend further, our orbit gets faster and faster. At its lowest point, we get to 5 kilometers above the core, going over 8 kilometers per second with a period of 3 seconds. Sadly, at some point, we receive a massive spike in reentry heating, which destroys the craft. Well, that's about all I have for you. Using the power of Bendy Tech, Loading range, physics toggling, and landing state gifting, 
we have created an underground base to study the true nature of KSP planets. We've discovered that KSP planets are hollow and contain a black hole at their cores. We've even gotten within 5 kilometers of this intense gravitational source, experiencing well over a thousand g's of gravity in the process. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you in the next one.